I'm really honored today to have uh, the opportunity to uh, give a little introduction to you about uh, something uh, in our, uh, traditional China, something uh, which is very important to traditional China and um, it's still very important in our, um, our present day China. Uh, my um, topic today is our uh, rituals in Confucian China. Um, maybe um, I need to uh, say a little bit uh, more about the keywords in this um, title. Uh, that's uh, uh, except in the other three words, um, ritual, Confucian, and China. And um, among these three words, um, I think the simplest one is um, China. But here, um, I like also to make a little bit a uh, 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 restriction. That's um, uh, today my lectures are mainly about traditional China, and um, in which um, rituals, especially our Confucian our, uh, Confucianism, um, um, is our fundamental philosophy um, that is um, underlying in uh, the uh, traditional Chinese society. And the other two words, um, uh, ritual and Confucian, are actually um, um, the keywords that I like to deal with in uh, um, my uh, lecture today. Um, first, I'd like to uh, make a clarification um, of uh, a few terms that I'm going to use today. Um, they are uh, uh, Confucianism, or in our if uh, we want to translate it in a more exact way, that's the school of Ru. And uh, also the name Confucius, um, uh, in uh, Chinese, he's called Kongzi. Confucius is actually a, a um, um, translation of uh, the name of Kongzi by uh, the 17th century uh, Jesuit missionaries who came to China. Um, the, uh, the second thing is um, about uh, the word or the character in um, Chinese, which is generally translated into a uh, ritual and into something else, and that's a uh, li. It's translation and interpretation. Since it's uh, the key word that I'm going to deal with today, um, I will talk about um, the the origin and the evolution of uh, Li and how it uh, turns, uh, how it changes um, eventually from our um, ceremonial, um, our rich religious ceremonies or religious rituals um, into a world that encompasses almost everything in uh, Confucian society, our, our kind of our social structure or social grammar that um, um, stipulates or prescribes every kind of activity um, in a Confucian society. Um, for uh, this part, for this uh, 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 evolution, I like to uh, talk a little bit about the origin of Confucian rituals and um, Kongzi, or Confucius' revitalization and rationalization of uh, these rituals. And uh, after that, I would like also to um, make a distinction uh, between uh, ritualism and legalism. Um, ritualism is something uh, uh, propounded uh, by um, the Confucians, uh, which um, uh, consider uh, ritual to be um, the most important element in a harmonious society. And the other word, legalism, is another school of thought that existed in, um, um, in, in ancient China, uh, which um, um, emphasizes strict law in the ruling of a government. And after that, I'd like to um, um, explain how um, during the Han Dynasty, that's um, about um, the beginning of um, the first century or the second century, um, how um, Confucianism uh, combined with uh, the yin-yang cosmology at that time and uh, 
And this combination, um, again, brought back the religious element into uh, 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 the Confucian doctrines. And uh, until the Song Dynasty, that's uh, about another th thousand years um, later, um, ancestor worship, which is um, one of the most important element in Confucian ritual, uh, became formalized and popularized among the commoners. So uh, from uh, this time on, um, ancestor worship um, is no longer or formalized or, or ritualized ancestor worship is no longer a priority of the uh, upper class, but it became a practice that is uh, generally performed uh, by almost every member in the society, every family in the society. Um, the last thing are, um, of uh, my talk today is uh, to uh, introduce some major types of Confucian rituals. All right. Um, now I'd like to say a few words to explain um, these uh, terms. Um, first is uh, the relationship between um, Confucianism and Kongzi. As I said just now, uh, Confucius is actually a, a translation of uh, the um, Jesuit missionaries uh, of uh, Kongzi, or more exactly Kong Fuzi, Master Kong, into uh, English. But actually, first not in, into English, but into Italian, and then uh, translated into English. Um, and then from the word Confucius um, is uh, um, created or invented the word Confucianism, uh, which is uh, the school of Wu. Um, this, this translation might be a little bit misleading because um, the Confucianism seems to imply that um, this entire school of thought is uh, created or founded by uh, Kongzi or by Confucius, but actually, um, it is a little bit uh, um, uh, more complicated than that. First of all, um, Kongzi himself did not consider himself to be a founder or a creator of a whole doctrine of thought. He considered himself to be a preserver, an interpreter of ancient rituals. And uh, the word Ru, uh, which uh, uh, constitute um, uh, uh, the name of the school, that's uh, the school of Ru, um, referred to, originally referred to a, uh, an ancient profession uh, which was in charge of um, uh, sacrificial ceremonies. And this is also why our rituals uh, is so important in uh, the thought of Confucius. But then, um, not only uh, Confucius himself, but also um, his um, contemporaries and his uh, uh, direct followers uh, consider uh, Confucius to be only a great master and also a great teacher of the ancient rituals. Um, what is actually uh, most important in this uh, so-called preservation and interpretation is that uh, Confucius had um, imbued um, new meanings and significations into the rituals, which uh, became the spirit of rituals, and which is also uh, uh, what uh, 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 has been uh, carried on and passed down from generation to generation, and became uh, the, uh, the spirit of Confucianism. So. Um, as we consider uh, the school of Ru today, we will uh, naturally um, take Kongzi to be uh, the founder of the school. But um, his invention or creation uh, is uh, actually based on the ancient rituals which existed from um, the earliest recorded dynasty of uh, Chinese history, that's the Shang Dynasty, and then um, reformed in the Zhou dynasty, and which uh, 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 was um, what uh, Kongzi uh, inherited from. Uh, 
um, another thing is um, the trans translation and interpretation of uh, the word li. Um, in the title of my talk, I use the word retro, but this is merely uh, one of uh, uh, the many translations that has, uh, have been used to translate the word li. It has been uh, variously translated into retro, rights, uh, propriety, or uh, etiquette, and ceremony, manners, or even culture or cultivation. Um, um, the word li um, originally um, uh, arise from um, um, the primitive religious ceremonies of sacrifice. So it is um, from this perspective, it is um, right or it is um, um, reasonable to translate it into a ritual or ceremony. But then um, many um, later interpreters of our, uh, Confucianism consider this to be too rigid or uh, uh, consider this translation um, and uh, did not uh, um, reflect what is most important uh, in the concept of Li in Confucianism. So um, um, later, uh, many scholars prefer other translations like propriety or uh, manners or uh, culture. And these are more abstract words. Um, I'd like now to um, cite um, some interpretations um, done by our uh, two or uh, uh, three actually are most important, um, uh, three important um, sinologists uh, in their works about uh, Chinese thought. The first one is taken from uh, Disputers of the Tao, written by A.C. Graham in the 1980s. Um, A.C. Graham was uh, uh, one of the forerunners uh, of, uh, among the sinologists who brought um, uh, uh, classical Chinese thought um, into uh, the same uh, um, dimension, or in other words, to study our uh, classical Chinese thought with reference to Western philosophy. And he translated the word li into ceremony um, based on his uh, principle of translation because he wanted to um, um, to, to retreat uh, the most uh, um, elementary or the most primitive um, aspect of uh, the word, which um, um, uh, he considers a ceremony to be a very uh, appropriate um, translation of Li. And um, this is his uh, um, interpretation of the term. The word Li, or ceremony, embraces all rites, customs, manners, conventions, from the sacrifices to ancestors down to the detail of social etiquette. Li in social intercourse corresponds to a considerable extent with Western conceptions of good manners. The Confucian gentleman moves with an effortless grace within the framework of fixed convention, informing every action with consideration and respect for the other person. So um, here, um, Graham uh, delineated the, the range that uh, Lee covers in social life. But uh, what is most important in his uh, um, explanation is uh, the, the last sentence of this uh, quotation. Uh, the Confucian gentleman moves with an effortless grace within the framework of fixed convention. Um, as we know, generally when we refer to uh, some fixed convention, it might refer to our rigid, rigidity or formality. Um, but here, for a Confucian gentleman or for a Confucianist, to, um, uh, to such a, a gentleman, uh, these fixed conventions uh, reflect not rigidity, but uh, what is um, um, most important is uh, the spirit, the sincerity, and reverence that is uh, um, behind this uh, uh, ritual, this fixed convention. And a Confucian gentleman 
or perhaps um, we should not use the word gentleman because it's uh, too, uh, it's loaded with uh, Western uh, um, significations. A Confucianist uh, is required to practice these rituals, these daily rituals, for example, like how to uh, behave towards a superior, uh, uh, towards a senior, or how to behave towards a person who is younger than you. And these, although there are uh, codes of rituals which uh, stipulate how you should behave, but to a person who is uh, well cultivated uh, by Li, should uh, do all this with an effortless grace. That uh, should uh, do this in a spontaneous or natural manner. So that it seems that these rituals come, come directly out of your heart, but not artificially from outside. And uh, informing every action with consideration and respect for the other person. And this is also a, a, an important aspect of Li. Uh, also the reason why it is important in, uh, with, or in maintaining a harmonious uh, social relationship because um, a person practicing with Li will um, um, naturally show respect for the other person that he's uh, uh, communicating with. So that, um, that is our uh, basic function of Li, or ritual, in our Confucian thought. Um, another interpretation is made by our Roger Ames and Henry Rosemont in their new translation of the Analects of Confucius. The Analects is a book that uh, records um, their, the activities and words by Confucius. Um, by his disciples. Um, and this uh, quotation uh, reads like this, Li, are those meaning invested roles, relationships, and institutions which facilitate communication and which foster a sense of community. They are a social grammar that provides each member with a defined place and status within the family, community, and polity. Li are life forms transmitted from generation to generation as repositories of meaning, enabling the youth to appropriate persisting values and to make them appropriate to their own situations. Now this is more uh, an abstract interpretation of the function of Li in our uh, traditional uh, Confucian society. Um, it is um, considered a social grammar that um, stipulates um, the role of each member in a society. A mutual relationship uh, among um, all the members in a society as to uh, how, uh, how a youth uh, or a child should behave towards their parents or the elders and how a superior should behave towards the inferior and vice versa. And because of these complicated um, social uh, uh, grammatical rules, uh, Confucian society is considered to be um, revolving again, uh, uh, re revolving around uh, these um, li or rituals. Um, now I'd like to um, give a brief introduction to um, the origin and the evolution of Li um, throughout um, the Chinese history from the Shang Dynasty to um, at least to the Song Dynasty and later. The, the origin of Li, um, uh, Li originated from our, um, at least as early as uh, the uh, Shang um, Dynasty, um, that's about uh, 16th to 11th centuries BCE. Um, during the Shang Dynasty, um, the, its uh, mythological system includes uh, Shang Di, uh, the supreme god, and natural deities, and the king's ancestors. Um, eventually, you can see that uh, in Confucianism, um, the first two elements uh, were kind of uh, um, 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 ignored and at least are paid uh, less and less attention to the, uh, in the later uh, generations. But um, the role of ancestor uh, become most uh, prominent in this uh, system. 
and the Shang people um, um, worship the supreme, supreme God, natural deities, and the king's ancestors. And these um, um, sacrificial or, or these religious um, um, beliefs or uh, rituals were passed down to uh, the later um, dynasty, that's the Zhou dynasty, um, with less stress on the religious aspect than on uh, its uh, social aspect or social political aspect of uh, these uh, rituals. And uh, Kongzi um, inherited from the Zhou um, dynasty uh, these ritual forms and put his own meaning in it. Originally, um, um, rituals in the Shang dynasty um, serve um, mostly a religious um, um, purpose. It serves as a channel between the noumenal world and the human world. It's, it's, it prays for um, blessings from deities and ancestors, and it determines the future course of events, um, mostly uh, through uh, divination and trying to uh, determine uh, what, uh, what might happen, what's um, um, uh, lucky or unlucky in the future events. But um, after uh, the Zhou dynasty, uh, this uh, religious aspect uh, became uh, um, less and less important, and the social aspect uh, started to emerge. Um, up to Kongzi's time, uh, the profession which uh, was originally in charge of uh, the religious uh, sacrificial uh, ceremonies uh, had already declined, but uh, Kongzi kind of uh, revitalized uh, the profession of Ru in uh, a very uh, uh, actually in a very radical way because he has um, changed the meaning of the word rule into a totally different word. Um, for this part, I like to talk about uh, Kongzi's preservation or actually a uh, renovation or uh, revolution of the Zhou ritual. Um, I like to talk about um, his attitude towards the supernatural and uh, what is ritual to Kongzi and his attitude towards tradition, and finally, uh, the role of ritual in his ethical political doctrines. I hope from this uh, brief outline, I can show you how um, uh, Kongzi su uh, succeeded in um, kind of uh, changing the meaning of the worldly from our uh, rituals to uh, something more spiritual or more um, ideological. Um, first, I'd like to uh, talk about his attitude towards the supernatural. Um, his words, as recorded in the Analects, um, um, actually laid a keynote for um, later uh, Confucians who are uh, um, considered more important to um, put emphasis on the living on the society instead of on uh, the other world. It is in this way that um, um, Kongzi uh, kind of did away with the religious meaning while still uh, uh, retaining what he thought to be important in, in the religious uh, ceremonies. Um, in the Analects, it is recorded that uh, one of uh, Kongzi's disciples asked him about uh, gods and about death. And Kongzi answered, if you cannot serve man, how can you serve the gods? If you do not know about life, how do you know about death? Um, throughout uh, Analects, Kongzi hardly said anything about supernatural beings, about uh, death, about gods, about uh, the heaven, or about human nature, etc. However, um, even even in, uh, in his um, um, kind of uh, um, dismissal of these uh, supernatural uh, um, elements in his uh, um, 
uh, teachings or doctrines. He, he took sacrificial ceremonies, sacrificial rituals, uh, very uh, seriously. Um, the, the second quotation is um, about his attitude towards the sacrificial uh, ceremonies. He sacrificed to the dead as if they were present. He sacrificed to the spirits as if the spirits were present. The master said, I consider my not being present at the sacrifice as if I did not sacrifice. So um, this attitude seems to be a kind of uh, uh, complicated at least, if not contradictory. So on the one hand, he did not uh, he was not willing to talk about what he did not know. That's about the supernatural, about gods or, or ghosts, or about uh, souls or spirits. But on the other hand, he did not do away with uh, um, the sacrificial ceremonies, which originally intend for the worship of these supernatural beings. Um, what um, is, what uh, Kongzi did retain in the ceremonial um, um, formalities are a spirit of um, sincerity and reverence to something which um, um, is um, beyond oneself. But uh, whatever that thing is, Kongzi refused to talk about. This page is um, a few examples as, um, about uh, Kongzi's active, daily activities as recorded by his uh, disciples in the Analects. They are about very trivial everyday activities, but um, from, this, uh, from these examples, we can see how Kongzi uh, value uh, the traditional uh, rituals, not only ceremonial rituals, but also rituals about how to behave in everyday life. Uh, Confucius did not sing on the same day in which he had been weeping. He did not eat rice, which had been injured by heat or damp and turned sour, nor fish or flesh, which was gone. He did not eat what was discolored or what was of a bad flavor, nor anything which was ill-cooked or what uh, or was not in season. He did not eat meat, which was not cut properly, nor what was served without its proper sauce. When eating, he did not converse. When in bed, he did not speak. If his mat was not straight, he did not sit on it. So these are a few examples that I uh, took offhandedly from uh, the Analytes. Um, but then um, his attitude uh, towards these rituals, um, well, uh, what's most important to him is not these formalities, which seem to be really rigid. Um, uh, from um, our own perspective. However, um, what is most important to uh, uh, Kongzi is not um, these. Now, from um, this quotation, we might uh, see a, a little bit about uh, what Kongzi thinks to be most important in a ritual. The master said, if a man be without the virtues proper to hum humanity, what has tea to do with the rights of propri propriety? Um, here, um, uh, Li is uh, translated into the rights of propriety. Uh, if a man be without the virtues proper to humanity, what has he to do with music? So um, this is a kind of general principle that uh, Kong considers ritual uh, to be. And we can uh, use some other um, examples to see how he uh, considers uh, tradition and how he considers um, the rituals. This example, Lin Fang, is uh, one of uh, Kongzi's disciples. Uh, once he asked what was the first thing to be attended to in ceremonies, in rituals, the master said, a great question indeed, in festive cer ceremonies, it is better to be sparing than extravagant. In the ceremonies of mourning, it is better that there be deep sorrow than a minute attention to observances. So this example shows that um, in a ritual, what's most important to uh, Kongzi are not those um, ceremonial formalities or rigid 
uh, fixed conventions, but the spirit that's underlying these rituals. So uh, to our Confucius, for example, in the ceremonies of mourning, uh, which are generally uh, is, uh, is directed towards those dead, um, Confucius considered uh, um, most important for one to be in deep sorrow. That's to be sincere in the mor morning than uh, to uh, uh, carry out all those um, minute uh, formalities of uh, uh, their ceremonies. In other words, if you are not sincere, if you do not really have that sorrow in, uh, in a morning uh, ceremony, then it's better not to uh, perform these uh, uh, rituals at all. But again, um, this does not mean that uh, Kongzi uh, did not pay any attention to the formalities. It's just the opposite. He pays attention to both aspects. And uh, he emphasizes uh, the uh, perfect um, combination of uh, the performance of formalities and your sincerity at heart. So uh, in, on another occasion when uh, uh, another of his disciples asked him about, uh, um, uh, 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 about ceremony, he uh, gave a different answer. Zi Gong, um, that's uh, his uh, Kongzi's disciple, wished to do away with the offering of a sheep connected with the inauguration of the first day of each month. Um, this is also an important uh, ritual in uh, Kongzi's time. The master said, Zi, uh, Zi is the, Zi Gong's another name. You love the sheep, I love the ceremony. Um, that's to say, um, um, uh, Kongzi did not agree to do away with the sheep simply because you want to save the sheep because it's an important part of the ceremony. So um, it is uh, the combination of these uh, two things which um, is most important to uh, Kongzi. Um, more importantly, um, Kongzi considers that if you um, cannot if you do not practice until you are perfect in the performance of these uh, formalities, it is not possible for you uh, to, to show your sincerity and show your reverence um, in these uh, uh, ceremonies. It's, um, well, uh, actually uh, this um, has given rise to a uh, comparison between uh, Confucius uh, philosophy and that of uh, uh, the speech act theory by uh, John Searle, uh, a famous American uh, philosopher. Uh, an American um, philosopher who was called uh, Herbert Fingeret wrote a book, um, um, Secular as Sacred, and he used mainly um, John Searle's speech act theory to uh, interpret um, uh, uh, Kongzi's um, um, theory of ritual in uh, the Analects. So even though his interpretations uh, might be uh, uh, might uh, depend too much on uh, uh, the speech act theory, I think um, that's one thing which um, um, is uh, most important uh, to our Confucius. That's uh, how he explained the sincerity of a person who is performing the ceremonies. Actually, um, one of um, the key terms of Confucianism, uh, cheng, is translated uh, sometimes into uh, sincerity. And this is the spirit of a per uh, that a person should have while uh, performing the rituals, no matter it's uh, ceremonial uh, rituals or daily rituals, uh, even including the shaking of hands or including uh, the nodding of uh, two people uh, who are uh, just uh, walking by each other. So uh, this, um, uh, to even to these um, uh, minute daily uh, rituals, um, what you are thinking in your heart might affect what, what are, might affect your uh, performance of that ritual. But uh, the other way around, 
your performance of that ritual might also affect, might also uh, reflect how sincere you are. Um, all right, um, above are some examples that um, I like to uh, show uh, about how uh, Kongzi understand a ritual or how he reinterpreted a ritual in his own uh, way. So I'd like to uh, give a brief summary of the role of ritual in uh, Kongzi's um, doctrines. Uh, this, uh, this part is about um, how, um, how um, ritual may, of, may uh, affect uh, social um, life or even become the, the foundation or the basis of um, the ethical political structure in a society. Um, there are some more examples about how um, these rituals, which are no matter they are uh, um, sacrificial rituals or daily rituals, um, how can these rituals um, be uh, uh, kind of uh, extended uh, to uh, an entire society and become a social, the basis of social order? Now, this is how Confucius um, um, imbue new meaning to uh, the ritual of his day. Um, the first example, Confucius said of the head of the Ji family, um, uh, Ji family is, uh, uh, is actually a, a, a vassal in um, the dukedom of Lu, that's uh, Kongzi's uh, uh, hometown. Um, Lu was a dukedom and our uh, and the ruler, the supreme ruler of uh, that dukedom is the Duke of Lu. However, um, at that time, uh, the Ji family had a kind of um, um, uh, superseded the power of um, the Duke of Lu and, and had uh, virtually taken over um, the entire uh, government. So um, this is an example uh, that Confucius expressed his um, uh, um, discontent or dissatisfaction towards uh, the Ji family. Um, Confucius said of the head of the Ji family who had eight rows of pantomimes in his area. Uh, the eight rows of pantomimes, uh, sometimes also called the eight row dance, this is also a traditional um, ritual dance uh, which is performed in uh, the court or in uh, the family of uh, the, the aristocrats. But the eight row dance is um, um, ex exclusively um, uh, used for a, for, a, for a duke, not for um, his uh, vassal. And as to the Ji family, um, he, uh, he could only use the six row dance because of his rank. So uh, Confucius said, if, if he can bear to do this, what may he not bear to do? So this expresses his uh, discontent uh, towards uh, the G family's um, uh, uh, kind of uh, transgression of power. And uh, the second example is um, some uh, words recorded by uh, Kongzi's disciples. A prince should employ his minister according to the rules of propriety. Ministers should serve their prince with loyalty. Uh, this is how um, um, Kongzi understands uh, the relationship between uh, the superior and the inferior, uh, uh, between a prince and his ministers. And also, in a family, um, uh, Kongzi considers uh, these uh, rituals to be uh, most important uh, to, uh, to a son in his attitude towards the father, for example. Observe what a person has in mind to do when his father is alive, and then observe what he does when his father is dead. If for three years he makes no changes to his father's ways, he can be said to be a good son. Well, uh, this um, is called uh, filial piety in, uh, in Chinese society. And 
um, after Kongzi, um, um, many uh, followers of Kongzi, uh, um, uh, later Confucians, expounded greatly on this point until filial piety became the kind of uh, pillar stone of um, um, the entire uh, social political um, structure of uh, um, traditional China. That if a person is filial, then he shows due respect to his uh, parents. And uh, in that case, this uh, son will never um, um, transgress the orders of his superiors because um, um, the relationship of the superior and the inferior is uh, kind of analogized to that between parents and children. So um, this eventually became a most important doctrine in Confucianism in later uh, 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 generations. And it is also a reason why uh, the, it is very difficult for the Chinese uh, for, the, for the lower class of uh, the Chinese people to rebel against their superiors. All right, um, this is a summary of the role of ritual in Kongzi's uh, doctrines. First, it reminds people that they should ponder their own ancestral origins and feel gratitude for those who gave them life. Um, Second, it cultivates people's sense of order and organization, divides people into categories, and builds hierarchical relationships, assigning everyone a place in society and a form of behavior. That's because um, according to these ritual codes, uh, every, every member in a society uh, should abide by, uh, should uh, behave in a certain way uh, according to uh, these uh, rituals, and also according to his or her role in the society, whether you are a father or a son or a daughter uh, or a, a daughter-in-law, uh, etc. And thirdly, it enhances the awareness that one is part of a larger network of human beings, natural phenomena and supernatural phenomena. Uh, well, our later Confucians uh, later, uh, some later Confucians uh, again added supernatural aspect to uh, uh, the doctrine. We'll, we'll talk about this later. A few more words to say about um, the difference between ritualism and legalism. Well, actually, um, even though legalism or the, the school of law uh, was uh, one of uh, the major uh, schools of thought in ancient China, um, the founder of legalism is actually a pupil of um, a con uh, one of the uh, most important followers of Kongzi, uh, Xunzi, who is uh, 200 years, uh, uh, who, who lived 200 years later than uh, Kongzi. So um, the relationship between uh, Confucianism and legalism are, uh, is quite complicated. But um, um, this is a quotation um, taken from uh, the Analects um, by uh, Kongzi. Lead the people with administrative injunctions and put them in their place with penal law, and they will avoid punishments, but will be without a sense of shame. Lead them with excellence and put them in their place through rose and ritual practices, and in addition to developing a sense of shame, they will order themselves harmoniously. Um, well, uh, this um, quotation is um, often uh, 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 taken out to uh, show the difference between um, the rule of ritual and the rule of law. Um, and some people also uh, consider this to be a difference between a Chinese society and a Western society. That's uh, because uh, it is generally considered that uh, the Western societies are, uh, are ruled by law, whereas the Chinese society is ruled by uh, rituals. But um, I think perhaps there is some a misunderstanding that I would like to clarify a little bit today, um, I'd like to uh, give an example of um, 
uh, what is uh, legalism in uh, an, in uh, uh, traditional uh, Chinese society? And this example um, is about uh, a reform that was performed in the dukedom of Qin um, by the end of the spring and autumn period. Uh, a person called Shang Yang uh, initiated all these reform and became a, an important uh, representative of legalism. And the example is um, how uh, Shang Yang uh, succeeded in implementing um, his uh, strict laws in the dukedom of Qin and eventually brought Qin into a very powerful dukedom and, and finally uh, unified the whole uh, 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 China. And this, um, it, uh, the story uh, goes like this. Uh, Shang Yang had uh, um, created a system of strict laws, but before implementing these laws, he was afraid that people would not uh, obey his laws. So one day he, he had ordered a huge log to be erected in front of the south gate of the city. And then he, he, gave, uh, he posted a, a notice saying that whoever can move this log from the south gate to the north gate uh, will be rewarded uh, with uh, like uh, 10 kilograms of gold. At first, nobody believes him because this seems to be really absurd. But then when, when he raised the reward to uh, like 50 kilograms of gold, someone tried with a uh, kind of uh, um, um, thinking that even if I did not get the gold, I, I would only be uh, jeered by our other people to be silly. But if, if uh, 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 Shang Yang um, did our uh, um, what he promised, then I would be really rich. So he moved the log from the south gate to the north gate, and then he was really rewarded by uh, uh, 50 kilograms of gold. So from that time on, um, um, Shang Yang's laws were implemented strictly and without hesitation. <laughs> Well, um, this example uh, reminds me of a story uh, from the Bible that Abraham was ordered by God to sacrifice his firstborn son. Even though the two examples are quite different, but there's something in common uh, in both cases. That's um, um, both uh, the people in the Qin dukedom and uh, Abraham were uh, uh, expected to obey the laws of the superior without any questioning, without any hesitation, even if they could not understand why uh, the laws were given to them. So um, I think perhaps this is um, the principle that is um, buried deep in the legalism, uh, I mean the Chinese uh, legalism. And even uh, throughout uh, uh, the Chinese history, um, law generally um, means uh, the orders given by the superior. Even though um, we also have our systems of law, or codes of law, but um, in practice, this is more or less the case. But um, um, I do not know much about Western law, but as far as I understand, it's at least uh, modern law in Western societies are not like that. Um, is it from um, the, the, the period of enlightenment that, uh, um, uh, um, for example, like uh, American constitution is not based on some uh, um, unreasonable uh, orders by the superior, but based on some natural law, which is considered to be uh, 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 originated from uh, human heart or human reason or something like that. So perhaps we can make a kind of analogy between uh, the natural law in Western society and uh, what Confucius um, um, consider a ritual to be. Even though uh, these rituals are kind of more um, obscure than um, uh, the Western law because they, as uh, according to uh, Confucius, at least, these rituals sprang out from one's heart. 
and it uh, did not have very uh, uh, exactly formulated rules or um, regulations. Okay. Um, Um, after this, I'd like to um, say a few more words about how um, uh, Confucian rituals uh, developed after um, uh, Kongzi's time and eventually become uh, what it used to be uh, by the end of uh, 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 the Chinese uh, uh, Empire. Um, we are, I, I just said that our Kongzi kind of did away with uh, the, the supernatural or religious aspect of um, ritual. Um, his uh, followers, um, uh, his, uh, um, before the Han Dynasty, his followers um, mainly uh, followed Kongzi's uh, example and um, uh, talked very little about uh, um, heaven, about uh, gods or ghosts. But uh, during the Han Dynasty, another school of thought uh, was invented. That is called a yin yang cosmology. And this cosmological system um, is um, uh, characterized by projecting uh, the bureaucratic structure of this world onto the next. So there's a kind of correspondence between um, heaven and human society. Mm. And so our uh, Confucianism at that time was combined with this yin yang cosmological system and reintroduced the supernatural elements into um, ancestor worship especially. Uh, but even our, at that time, um, Confucian, Confucianism kind of um, um, break into two different strains, even though not, uh, not clear cut break, for example, the Confucian elites believe uh, that uh, there was uh, no god, no ghosts in the world, but it was not so in the folk religion, which was uh, uh, deeply influenced by uh, uh, those um, uh, yin yang uh, cosmology, and perhaps also a Taoist beliefs in the supernatural. So uh, from the Han Dynasty on, uh, these supernatural elements were reintroduced into our um, Confucianism, and um, the influence was uh, most obvious on uh, um, on our, um, people who uh, practice um, ancestor worship and and try to um, and hope that uh, the ancestors could uh, uh, return uh, favor to them. From, uh, from this time on, uh, the folk religion had um, been, um, well, had uh, be become, uh, um, in other words, ancestor worship in this way. That's uh, believing that the ancestors will become really gods in the heaven, and they can affect um, the decisions of the heaven, and then uh, 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 bring blessings to uh, his uh, um, um, posterities became a very important part of uh, the folk religion. And um, but it was during the Song Dynasty that uh, ancestor worship became uh, finally formalized and popularized among the commoners. Um, as I said just now, um, these um, uh, ancestor worship or other uh, um, um, ceremonial um, 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 rituals uh, originally were confined to the, the ruling class or to the upper class. And, but during the Song Dynasty, uh, some, um, some prominent uh, Confucians like uh, um, Cheng Yi and uh, Zhu Xi, um, they began to uh, um, expound the importance or the necessity of um, um, formalizing and popularizing um, ancestor worship to the lower classes. So even though um, th all through history, the lower classes were also uh, worshiping their own ancestors, but it was until um, the Song Dynasty that uh, they were uh, formal formalized 
that uh, it uh, was due to um, a very important Confucian, Zhu Xi. Um, he devised ritual manuals that helped this to be possible. So uh, ever uh, since that time, um, ancestor worship, Confucian um, ancestor worship uh, combined with a folk religion of believing in God and the supernatural power became um, uh, an important element in uh, um, the belief of our ordinary people in, uh, uh, in China. So um, in a word, um, there were actually um, two aspects of um, ritual in uh, Chinese society. The first aspect is that at ritual, uh, after the um, interpretation or uh, renovation by Kongzi and his uh, uh, important followers like uh, Mengzi and Xunzi, it became a kind of uh, ideology of our uh, um, traditional Chinese uh, society and also became a, a kind of backbone for uh, its um, social political system. And on the other hand, it also became a kind of religious support for uh, the common people uh, because they believe that if uh, they uh, worship their ancestors as well as other deities, natural deities and, and, uh, and uh, also uh, some heroes who are made uh, gods uh, in, um, in uh, folk mythology, um, if they worship all these gods and ancestors, they would uh, receive uh, more blessings and they could have a better future. So these two elements combined and became um, uh, kind of uh, the social structure, a kind of social structure of uh, traditional China. And Okay, uh, the last thing I'd like to uh, say a few words about the major types of Confucian rituals. And uh, for here, uh, the word ritual means um, the formalities, the ceremonies. Um, there are three, three major types of um, Confucian rituals that were uh, practiced throughout history. The first is the worship of heavenly gods and natural deities. And this again was performed um, uh, both uh, on the stately uh, level and on uh, the level of uh, the ordinary people. And the second thing uh, is ancestor worship, which is uh, the backbone of our Confucianism. And the third thing is a kind of derivative of ancestor worship, is the worship of Confucius, uh, who was um, um, uh, at his own time, he was considered merely a great master or teacher of ancient rituals, but um, up to the Tang Dynasty, that's about the 10th century, um, he was uh, uh, given a series of titles. And the most prominent one is uh, the uncrowned king. That's he was considered a kind of uh, uh, a king, but because he was uncrowned, uh, he was not really a king. And the word, uh, uh, which uh, the word in uh, Chinese, Wang, which is translated into, uh, um, it could be translated into king or prince, and it can also be translated into a benevolent ruler, as opposed to a ruler who uh, ruled by power, by mere power, but not benevolence. So um, this. Um, Confucius was um, at first um, given a title by the, uh, one of the Tang emperors as a duke, and then elevated to a prince. But then um, and another, because the word uh, can mean both king or prince, and uh, it can mean benevolent ruler who, uh, uh, who um, um, use uh, uh, benevolence or um, this, the excellence of humanity as uh, also uh, propounded by uh, uh, Kongzi to rule, um, um, the, the, to rule the uh, people or to rule the world. So um, uh, eventually uh, Kongzi got the um, title of the uncrowned king. 
but this is not an official title. Uh, as an official title, I think uh, the highest uh, that he got is the prince. Um, these are um, different uh, types of worship. Um, I think we can skip the, the details, and I, I'd like just to show you um, uh, the pictures. The Altar of Heaven, uh, which is now uh, uh, located in Beijing, is an important place where uh, the emperor uh, went to uh, worship um, heaven, worship uh, the, the supreme god. Even though this god is uh, quite different from uh, the god in Christianity, um, it is not personalized. It's something just like uh, the heavenly power or something like that. This is the altar of land and grain. Um, it's a traditional funeral ceremony. That uh, These are people who are supposed to be the, the uh, posterities of the dead were wearing the, the mourning garments. Um, these are spirit tablets or ancestor tablets, which were used to, uh, uh, um, uh, to be worshipped in a family temple, or if it's a very uh, small family, then it would be put uh, in the most important place in the hall or in the sitting room. Um, on the tablet were written uh, the name and the title of um, the ancestor. And a general practice of worshiping is uh, uh, to, um, uh, um, uh, to uh, uh, sacrifice um, uh, food and, uh, and wine and tea, and also burning incense and candles to, uh, 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 to show respect to the ancestors. And this is an, a uh, family temple. If um, the family is really a big one with a long genealogy, a long family tree, then all this, uh, this ancestor tablets would be put together in a temple and worshiped together. And generally, uh, for such uh, large families or clans, they would, they would keep a very uh, detailed record of genealogy um, um, with every one of the, uh, the male members of the um, family on it. A ritualized family sacrifice, it's a modern day one. It's a, well, it's a great family ancestral temple in, in Guangzhou, that's in the city where I came from. Sacrificial rites at the ancestral temple. And this is also a picture of the modern day, so we cannot uh, resurrect the uh, traditional uh, uh, um, images or uh, uh, rituals for you. This is um, the Confucius Temple in Qifu, Shandong. Actually, uh, the Confucius Temple is um, the family temple of the Confucius uh, ancestor of Confucius uh, uh, family, but then it became a place of worship for um, everyone uh, who are considered Confucius to be the great saint, great master. This apricot pavilion, are, um, it's a reconstruction, but it's a pro it, it, it is believed that our Confucius um, taught his uh, uh, pupils and disciples in the apricot pavilion. This is uh, their family uh, cemetery. This is something interesting. I'd like to know, uh, uh, um, say a few words. The final thing, um, it's uh, the imperial eight-row dance that's performed in Taipei in the year 2008. This is on the, uh, on the occasion of uh, worshiping Confucius. Um, um, if you remember, I just now I explained that the eight row dance was, uh, um, was uh, uh, reserved exclusively exclusively for the supreme uh, um, ruler of uh, the spring and autumn uh, period. But then here, um, this eight row dance was uh, used for the worship of Confucius. So um, one question that I have always had in mind is that I don't know if 
uh, Confucius were alive, what would he say about this? <laughs> OK, uh, that's uh, so much uh, uh, for my uh, talk today. Thank you very much for coming here. I know it's summer, and it's very nice of you to, to be able to come.